いたりいつきあっいたりめえよくでねばらにばしてくれておおのくっさらにいあのレベルあっあっあっあっあっあっあっあっあっあっあっあっあっあっはい、ありがとうございます。はい、ありがとうございます。はい、ありがとうございます。はい、ありがとうございます。はい、ありがとうございます。はい、ありがとうございます。はい、ありがとうございます。はい、ありがとうございます。はい、ありがとうございます。はい、ありがとうございます。はい、ありがとうございます。はい、ありがとうございます。はい、ありがとうございます。はい、ありがとうございます。はい、ありがとうございます。Uh, not, not in the normal way where people talk about, you know, the,、um, the politics of something or, you know, these sort of like really、um, material,、uh, you know, ways of like discussing issues and solutions and, and things like that. And、um, I have a big interest in sort of exploring the philosophical.、Uh, Narrative of the man, essentially, the story of the man. And、uh, I saw your video on、uh, men. I, I,、uh, I already forgot the title, but I watched it and I thought it was, it was quite interesting. And so I thought, yeah, let's, let's get her on the show. So this is、uh, Philosophicat, which I'm going to pronounce correctly because I don't know why people struggle with it, <laughs> but it seems that they do. And,、um, well, first, why don't you tell us a little bit about、uh, you know, who you are and why you have a channel, like what made you want to make this stuff, and what is the channel about? Yeah, well, thanks for、uh, inviting me on.、Uh, so, I think the video you were referring to was Traditional Man's Path to Heroism, which is,、yes. you know, to this date, what, still one of, my,、uh, one of my favorites. So, My flagship project is、um, an, a documentary series on Julius Evola's book, Revolt Against the Modern World, and each chapter gets its own episode. So、um, we're just about to release episode 12. But、uh, you know, the video that you referenced is also based on these Evolian ideas coming from you know, the world of tradition, as he calls it. And so that's something that I'm, I'm very interested in, just, just from the perspective of it being like a it, Comprehensive worldview, even. But when it comes to looking at current events and and hot topic issues and things like that, I feel like it provides、um, a very sturdy reference point from which to assess what is happening in the world. And that includes a lot of the stuff、uh, to do with you know, what we might call the gender wars or anything like that. So that's kind of where I'm coming from is I'm, you know, I don't like to get Really deep into like the nitty gritty of the political cultural battles. I,、um, you know, I've done my time in the trenches in that regard. And what I learned over the years was that game never ends. Nobody、mm-hmm. wins, <laughs> and you just exhaust a lot of your time and energy、um, on just dis- discussing these things. And so, you know, I had a period where I kind of pulled back and,、um, you know, sort of re emerged with a more、uh, philosophical and spiritual worldview that's a little bit more all encompassing. Um, so that's kind of where I'm coming from, you know, now at this stage. I'm, I'm a lot more interested in like the spiritual and metaphysical implications of these ideas and what we can learn from that.、Um, you know, I'm, I'm maybe a little bit、uh, black pilled in the sense that I, I tend to agree with Evola that civilization is kind of just on this. Unstoppable decline, this downward spiral. And while we can't do anything about that from a civilizational perspective, we can still do things individually for ourselves to remain standing amongst the ruins. And so that's kind of what I try to orient my content towards is, you know, what 
what are the ideas that might actually be helpful for somebody if they want to be one of the people who's standing amongst the ruins when this is all over? Um, you know, do you want to be one of the people who can withstand the collapse? And if so, what do you need to learn? What virtues do you need to inculcate in yourself? And so that has been a personal exploration for myself as well. And I like to share these ideas on my channel uh, in the event that, you know, maybe they're helpful to other people too. Yeah, I think that that's those are all great. I mean, we've talked about that ourselves. I don't actually believe that uh, it's black pilling to say that, you know, um, to essentially offer up a uh, a way for people to endure the suffering that is inevitably coming. And uh, I think that that is giving them an option. I mean, yeah, a lot of people, they're they're not going to listen. Uh, they're going to you know, self-indulge, they're going to do whatever. They're gonna pretend like nothing's happening, in fact. But they will end up, I think, suffering, unfortunately. And and you know, you can't you can't force people to change their behavior or change their habits. So, but you can change yours and you can try to help the people that are close to you and you can try and like you know put the word out and tell people, you know, that we're gonna be experiencing all of these problems and you should be you know, working on ways to endure that inevitable uh, suffering. But I don't think that that is necessarily, I guess, I'm, I'm, I'm very much against uh, embracing or even like humoring any kind of nihilism, uh, because I think that it's really easy to fall into a trap and uh, start dragging other people down with you. It's a lot easier to do that than the opposite. So. But I, I do appreciate, you know, what you're saying. I think that uh, you're you're making a lot of sense. And we've said very similar stuff on this show. Now, before we got into, um, before I got started, you had asked me a question. So I thought I would set this up because I noticed that there are some people watching that are fans of yours um, that are in our chat and they probably don't know us. So uh, I just want to give you guys a brief summary of what we do and what this channel is about. Uh, Honey Badger Radio or Badger Live Streams, which is this specific channel for live streaming. On this channel, we usually discuss uh, the, how do I put it? Uh, the issues that men face and boys face that most people don't want to look at or acknowledge. And we discuss this from a variety of perspectives. Part of it is political because some things in the world of politics just directly affect men because the state is in many ways the enemy of men. Um, but uh, also there are social issues, there are ideological issues, there are a, 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 a you know cavalcade of stuff, right? And this is the stuff that most people, regardless of their politics, regardless of their beliefs, uh, tend to not see. Because since men essentially keep everything running, even, even if our civilization is in decline, which I think is true, like most of what we benefit from, from the people who are so, how do I put it, uh, they take men for granted. They're, you know, uh, we understand that men are why we're able to have these conversations, why we're able to meet up on the internet, it's why, you know, we have running water and electricity and plumbing and et cetera. So we think that it's really important that people uh, not forget that and that men, uh, they need a place, you know, and, and in our current society and the way things are going and everything, it's like men have been excluded completely. I mean, I know that there's, for as an example, uh, Philosophicat, um, as an example, we have talked about the um, what's happening right now in this, like uh, you could say in the cultural struggle or whatever, you got like the pro-trans lobby that's essentially saying that, you know, gender doesn't exist, um, Men, you know, uh, it's a social construct. Masculinity is a social construct. And also men are terrible because, you know, they run the world and they do so at the expense of women, et cetera, and so on. But simultaneously claiming that women don't exist and men don't exist either. And the counter arguments to it 
uh, from you know conservative commentators tends to be something like uh, this ideology is harmful because it's harmful to women. And they will talk about things like sports and you know these kinds of things. But the way that we approach this is we say, well, wait a minute. If men have been like assaulted culturally for a, at least a hundred years, because I think this you could trace this misandry, this hatred of men and masculinity back to uh, intellectual elites like Mary Wollstonecraft and Mary Shelley and so on. So this isn't new. Um, what does that do over time as people basically say men shouldn't be able to congregate with each other men shouldn't be able to spend time with each other uh and and mentor each other and fathers don't need to be in the homes and we're going to take them out and you know we're going to pro we're going to be pro prohibition and prevent men from drinking and going to clubs and things like this and what does that do over multiple generations if it doesn't affect a young man, a boy's um, ability to essentially like perceive himself as masculine and not think that that's some kind of curse. And I, I think that we're dealing with the, the consequences of that and the fact that the answer to that seems to still be let's protect women at all costs. This is the 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 challenge. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is what we do. We try to bring attention to the thing that no one wants to talk about because it's so easy to say, women have it worse, let's take care of them. And then what does that do to women? You know, because I, I could talk about the negative effects of that as well. What are your yeah, thoughts on that? We, what we essentially have is like, I mean, a, a big part of the problem around this conversation is that oftentimes it gets um, hooked into this, uh, it's almost even a tangent guess, of trying to figure out, well, which was the first domino that fell in this series? Who can we pin the blame on? And there's this constant going back and forth. Well, if women didn't do this, men wouldn't do that. If men didn't do this, women wouldn't do that. And it's like, it's, it's this really almost pointless discussion at this point, because so many dominoes have fallen, we cannot possibly put them back up. The question is, what can you as an individual do to put the brakes on this in your own personal life? Because we've already established, you know, what you're not going to fix civilization. Maybe, maybe that happens collectively at some point, but as an individual person, all you can do is say, what virtues can I build up in myself? How can I resist the pull of this decline? How can I not be one of these dominoes that's falling? How, you know, how do you not be part of the problem? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of like the, the back and forth blame game is part of the problem because it's creating that further deepening of division and resentment and hatred between the sexes because nobody wants to take responsibility for their part in it. Everybody's expecting the other side to fix things. Nobody wants to work together, which, you know, this is exactly what the powers that be want. And this is why they attacked men first and foremost, because I think we can um, probably agree that, um, you know, the system is attacking masculinity the way that they are because they know that every single revolution in human history has been the work of men. Um, you know, we're not going to see an army of women go up against the system. Um, even the massive protests we see of women are not grassroots protests. They're completely astroturfed by the powers that be. Um, so to say that this is all on men's shoulders is just a simple reading of history simply because men have always been the thinkers and actors in history as you yourself just uh, pointed out. So it's not a stretch to say that men will be the ones to correct this in some way, but that's not the same as saying that you know, women have no part in this and we should just sit back on our laurels and wait for men to, to clean up the mess. Um, you know, I, I can't speak for all women and I, I certainly wouldn't uh, pretend to, but for myself, I look at that and I'm kind of like, well, you know, as a woman, what does that mean I should be doing? And I'm kind of like, well, you know, how can I support men? What does it mean for me to actually be a virtuous woman who is refusing to take part in this and embodying, you know, the metaphysical feminine principle in a way that's healthy? Um, does that affect anybody else in the world? I don't know, but it's good for me. And it helps me to not be part of the problem, which isn't to say that, I, you know, I'm, I'm a product of the modern age myself. So I'm not a perfect person by any means. And I'm sure there are things I've, 
I've done that have contributed to the problem as, as we all have. Um, but I think where it becomes really unhealthy is when you get, um, you know, a camp of men and a camp of women and both sides want to see themselves as victims of the other. And they start, they start almost behaving in a way that gives the other side something to be right about, you know, um, they start actually like embodying the worst characteristics that the opposite side is accusing them of. And it almost creates like this self-fulfilling Self, prophecy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm, I, I'm not interested in, in blame. Uh, you know, we, you asked me if, if our channel was like a MGTOW, uh, channel and um we have a lot of MGTOW viewers but it's not like something that we necessarily uh i, I wouldn't call our you know us that i mean i'm i i, I probably wouldn't count because i'm married and you know my my wife is the one who told me about you but we understand that there are going to be men who are you know they've been burned by the system they're frustrated or, or whatever and they're going to like they're going to be looking for a place to go to get answers try to understand what they need to do and and that's what we try to provide we don't want to constantly foster resentment but we do want to call out you know injustices when they happen uh, but that's usually on like a case-by-case -case basis right so mm -hmm. i i don't disagree and i actually really like that you are and this is what i'm seeing i'm seeing this more and more and let me know if you are seeing this too more and more women that are coming forward in some to some degree they open a channel or they are post on social media or something and they're looking for a way to oh sorry i got i just got a notification um and they're looking for some way to uh bridge that gap right and 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 one of the ways they're doing it is it's not really about uh reaching out to men it's about like a lot of these women are doing introspective work right they're like what what do i need to do to be a virtuous woman as you put it which is something that i brought up before as well because and this comes back to what i was saying before our society um it protects women at all costs, but it also tremendously infantilizes them. And I believe that the way that the average woman behaves today isn't even feminine. It's basically like they're children, right? They, they and, and, I, and I think, and I'm not saying this as an attack or an insult. I'm saying this as an observation. I think that we have, uh, you know, the powers that be could have done this too, because I know a lot of this comes out of academia and, and the entertainment industry and our culture, et cetera. But we essentially tell women it's okay to behave as narcissistic children. And some, if not many, they go right into that. And, and then we pretend as though that what's being displayed is, is femininity. And, um, and it's purest form, right? So you did a video about um, not just the male hero's journey or how to do that, but the female one. And so I wanted to uh, get your thoughts on what I think is, you know, is happening and what you think like, you know, a virtuous woman is. Yeah, so what you're saying is very correct. You you have this phenomenon where women are, you know, they're worshiping at the altars of their own narcissism. And in my video, I sort of explore why this is. Um, anybody who's interested can read more about this, specifically in Evola's book on Eros and the Mysteries of Love, as well as the chapter on men and women in revolt against the modern world, which uh, were kind of my two primary source materials for that video. And um, you know, basically what is happening when women do that is that, um, so the, the, the dharma of a woman, mm -hmm. her essential nature, like what is femininity really about? Um, according to the world of tradition, that is what we would call bhakti or active devotion and dedication. Well, a woman needs to be devoted and dedicated to something. And traditionally speaking, that would be the solar principle embodied by the masculine. Now, when um, men are no longer embodying that sufficiently, um, or it, for whatever reason, it's not available to a woman, maybe she just doesn't have any men in her life, like maybe she's, you know, raised by a single feminist mom or something like that. I don't know. There's a, there's a number of reasons why this could be. Odds are. 
whatever the reason (laughs) is, if there isn't a solar principle there for a woman to orient around and to serve because she's a woman approaches the transcendent higher ideal through the man, through the service of him. And he then serves the ideal. And so there's almost like this chain of transmission. If we're missing the man in that we don't access the transcendent. We can't serve that higher ideal. And we start serving uh, very fleeting material things, um, including, you know, ourselves, especially ourselves. Um, and so this narcissism comes in and women of course are the nature of woman is, is Venusian. It's to be, uh, fascinated with that, which is beautiful and sensual and natural, um, in the sense of materiality. And what is more emblematic of that than the worship of her own physical body, her own attractiveness and vanity. And so, you know, um, kind of within these spheres, a lot of the time, what you see is that, um, women are accused of having simp cults. I don't know if you've heard this term. Oh yeah, I've, yeah, uh, we, yeah. we have talked so, about it, yes. And I mean, it's a real phenomenon, it is. And men are right to be concerned and suspicious about this um, because there are many women who attempt to create this cult of narcissism, but you don't have a cult if you don't have worshipers. You need other Mm -hmm. people to come and prostrate themselves before your altar. And so that's essentially what a lot of these um, women influencers do, you know, the Instagram models and stuff like that. They, they thrive on the dopamine hits of the attention that they're getting in this regard of showing off their bodies in a, you know, very sexual and provocative ways, um, holding men under a spell of sexual power, which is very easy to do because, men having lost that masculine chrism um, have also lost the capacity for self mastery. And so they are easy. Like if you do not master yourself, you will have a master outside of yourself, said Aristotle. And this Mm -hmm. is so, so true of modern people. And for men, that master outside of themselves often tends to be whatever is the object of sexual desire for them. And that can take the form of a woman that they simp for, or it can be pornography, um, or it could be a woman they're in a toxic relationship with in some way. It could even be their mother. I'm actually considering even just doing a video on this specific subject about the nature of how the feminine can subvert the masculine in this way. Because I do think men need to be aware of this. It's um, You need to be aware of the dangers that are out there. But where it becomes a problem for men is when they become fixated on this. And then they start... Um, you know, letting women live rent free in their head. And to, to use an analogy, um, it's like if you're in a racing car and you don't want to hit the side rails, because of course that would cause an accident. You could die. It's very dangerous. So when you're driving a race car, you don't make the side rail, the focus of your attention. When you're turning the corner, you turn your eyes to where you want to go, not at what you don't want to hit. So you have to take your mind's attention off that and just focus on the goal. And that doesn't mean you forget that the rails are there or that they're dangerous um, because that is a real thing, but you have to put your mind towards the solution. So as a man, be aware of the danger that women represent and mythology is full of warnings about this, but you have to look first and foremost towards your own heroism, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, um, And so then what is... So that yeah, because I think that what's what's happened now, and we are dealing with this degeneration of the family and the relationship between men and women and children's position in that you know hierarchy, um, uh, and and it's you know it's basically making everyone miserable, which it, it, especially women I think because uh, I've seen. And maybe it's because men are less likely to complain, but I, I've seen studies that show that even though we have essentially, um, we're all worshiping women right now, probably to a degree that we never have before, but in but in a in a childlike pandering way, it's not like uh, you know for oh, it's not like we're giving women credit for the you know anything noble or uh, virtuous that they do. We simply give them credit for existing, which is why. You know, they don't, um, uh, you know, like, for example, Mother's Day comes around 
and we celebrate motherhood. Father's Day comes around and we celebrate motherhood. We just celebrate single motherhood. And we try to be as considerate and inclusive of that as possible, right? And and this makes women feel good, right? It's like they, they get that, you know, dopamine hit of, oh, well, I'm a single mom, therefore I'm more brave, I'm more hardworking, I'm a better mother than the average one. But it doesn't actually give them anything really fulfilling. It doesn't actually make them happy. And I think that this is the reason why women are generally, um, or, and again, it could just be that they're more likely to complain, but they're generally more unhappy than their male counterparts. Well, I do believe they make up the bulk of antidepressant prescriptions. Yeah, and they're, and, yeah, they, and, and they therapy too. They are more too. likely to complain because in some sense, like, you know, within a relationship, women tend to be the relationship mechanics, right? They're always on the lookout for things to be unhappy about and things that can be improved. Whereas men are, once they're in a groove, they tend to just kind of settle into it. And that yeah. is that is due to the mutable nature of the feminine and the fickleness. And uh, whereas the masculine principle does have that tendency to be more fixed. Um, but, you know, I think what what you're saying is correct. Women are not actually happy they there's an ego gratification involved and that can mimic happiness in the short term but at the end of the day there's still a deep hole that's not being filled there's still that current of dissatisfaction or misery and i think a large part of it is you know just based on kind of my observations and reflections i have wondered if it's possible that many women are you know, they're frustrated at feeling like they have to fulfill the masculine role in life as well. Mm -hmm. Um, especially like where sometimes women create this situation and other times they're just subjected to it. Like, but in either case, it's like the men in their life are not in their perception doing their job as men. And so the women are basically being like, oh no, this job has to get done. I'm stressing out about it. I'm just going to start taking the lead. I'm going to be, and they start taking on these masculine roles, even unconsciously, which then forces their partner to the sidelines, which that itself then comes back and reinforces their view that he's being useless. Because even if he wanted them to come back into that space and take over the masculine active role, she won't let him because she's got this idea that she knows best and she can do it all herself. And, you know, we're conditioned from a young age to see men as like useless, overgrown children um, who just kind of eat us out of house and home and leave Again, their socks that, lying yeah, around. That's and, part of know, that same cultural thing I was talking about. Yeah, yeah, like men in some ways are almost being infantilized as well in, in the eyes of women. And so- They're like messy you know, we're, pets. We're being raised <laughs> with this idea that first of all, we can do anything which mm -hmm. isn't true and sets us up for a lot of disappointment because a lot of girls actually grow up believing this and they really yeah. internalize that belief and they can't accept reality when it, when confronted with the fact that actually they can't do something or men are better than they are at something like you see this in the idea that women think that they could beat a man in a physical fight if they just learned some self-defense moves let me tell you i got really bad with <laughs> flash once testing out this theory with my yeah. husband <laughs> oh, can you tell me, a, tell us a little bit about it. I think it's a funny, sounds like a funny story. Oh my gosh. Well, where I was living at the time, I used to go jogging on this path by the river and there was like some sex predator who was attacking women jogging on oh. their own. And so my husband was like, I don't know if I want you going out by yourself. And I'm like, well, you know, you're at work all the time and I, you know, otherwise I'll never go. And I was like, but don't worry. I've been watching some self-defense videos on YouTube. I said, and I said, you got, I've this. got moves. I've got moves. <laughs> and I, and he's like, really, you've got moves. Now my husband's like six foot four used to be a ballet dancer. So he's like, he was pretty strong, much stronger than me. And I'm not a small woman. Um, mm -hmm. but I'm like, okay, so grab me from behind by my ponytail and I'll show you what I can do. And he's like, okay. And he grabs my ponytail and within a half a second, I was flat on my back on the floor with a sore <laughs> neck. <laughs> he's like, so when does your move start? And I'm like, well, you didn't even give me a chance to try it. And he's like, well, the sex predator is not going to give you a chance either. <laughs> like, well, it wasn't fair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's so, funny uh, because we do measure. Me. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's sadly, it's just evolution and biology, but, uh, uh, what I was going to say is, you know, it is it is kind of un, uh, unfortunate because 
uh, uh, most of us do measure and and women do this to themselves they measure their um their worth as women by comparing themselves to men and it, it's really strange because it means that you only move further away from like what you should be asking which is what is a heroic woman right like what does it mean like what 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 and i i've talked to so many people about this and i i kind of got an idea of where that's going but i want to hear your thoughts on this like what what is it uh because i think women are looking for this they're looking for their own um path to you know like uh of living a virtuous life and being okay with your feminine self and that vulnerability and so on so what do you think that is yeah you're right i women have women don't even have any idea what it means to be feminine now mm -hmm. they are comparing themselves am i a good enough woman by the standard of what men can do and it's like yeah but, it's like it's not the same thing they're they're polar opposites they're you're not your ability to be a woman has nothing to do with how well you function in a man's sphere according to men's standards and i understand why you know because we do our civilization is very um masculine oriented in terms of what is valued as success and you know women are not taught that being a successful woman means, you know, being a good wife or a good mother or just being good at feminine things. And, you know, it's not, uh, it's not something that you can just kind of externalize either. It really has to just be this internal quality. And so like, I think the best way, because you can't understand one without the other. This polarity means that masculine and feminine do not exist in a vacuum. You have to understand them in tandem and what their relationship is to each other in order for one to have any real meaning. So traditionally, as I said, men embody the solar active principle that is, you know, the source of light in the world. It's, um, it's the sun is emblematic of this principle, whereas women embody this lunar passive reflective principle of which the moon is emblematic. And if you consider as the moon moves through the sky every month, the moon's light is dependent on its relationship to the sun. When the moon is occupying the same slice of the sky as the sun, the moon has no light. Mm -hmm. There's nothing there. It's a dark, it's a dark new moon. But when it is at the opposite side of the sky as the sun, they're opposing each other. The moon is full and it is at its maximum light. So when they are at opposite ends of the spectrum, that is when the feminine shines most brightly because it's mm -hmm. reflecting best what the solar is giving it. And whenever the moon tries to move outside of that, then the light starts to decrease in one, in one way or another. So, you know, um, we have in, as I said, in mythology, we have a lot of, um, representations of, you know, the fall, right. In Christianity, this would be like the Garden of Eden story, but there's there's many myths that speak of this. And the, the theme is always um, what happens basically when the masculine principle identifies with and then becomes lost in the feminine principle until the masculine acquires its a feminine way of being, in which case it's no longer masculine. This is the this is the nature of the fall. So when this self-sufficient principle that is the masculine succumbs to the law of the principle uh, that has no light of its own and gives into these forces of desire represented by the feminine while well, we have the fall from spirituality into material reality um and then running in the opposite direction of that and this is the correct relationship between the masculine and feminine is when this centrifugal feminine force doesn't turn to these fleeting material objects but is instead focused um to a virile central stability and then it it is there that we find the limit to this feminine restlessness and the stability is transmitted from the masculine to the feminine and transfigures the possibilities of the feminine. It is something that's productive and creative rather than destructive, which is what the feminine unrestrained becomes. Um, so in this case, you know, it's absolutely necessary for the active masculine principle to remain wholly itself and not take on the qualities of the feminine. Now, mm -hmm. women can't orient around a man who's been subsumed into the feminine um, because then neither sex has a stable center that can provide this access. There's no polarity. The man's dharma, 
his essence is to be self-sufficient in every way. So what does that mean for a woman's nature? A woman's dharma is active dedication and devotion. It's absolute self-affirmation versus absolute dedication. Um, there's a, a sense of like fidelity of, of this bhakti type of devotion and a serving of somebody other than herself. And this is ultimately this acceptance of this sort of like passive reflective nature of woman um, is the essence of it. And so when mm -hmm. you have a woman who's trying to embody the solar qualities to take the lead, to be that active principle, which isn't to say that women shouldn't have any of that, because as, as mere mortals, we are all like to varying degrees, we have some masculine and some feminine in each of us. Yeah. Um, the percentage of that, you know, is going to vary from individual person to individual person. You want them to be in a healthy balance, but for yeah. women, ideally, you know, the feminine should still predominate. And there is this sense that when there is an active principle that is superior to you, that comes along, the natural role is to fall into the more passive position and to reflect the light of that man. And so, in order for women to really embody what it means to be a woman, they almost have to have that kind of man in their life. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem that I've thought about a lot. And um, I, I think at some point I might like to make a more comprehensive work on this because the position we find ourselves in now in the Kali Yuga is that, you know, men aren't up to the task and women are out of control. And yeah, so that's what it looks like know, to me too, because we've, Again, you know, we've taken the I think that men get their sense of of their uh, self as as men, mostly from their fathers. And the father basically just has to be what he was, the man that the woman fell in love with. And then he behaves in the world as as a man does. And his sons see that and they emulate that and they integrate the, the nurture of their mother, where they integrate it so that they have a little bit of that because otherwise they'll be cold and psychopathic. Um, but they, but they, the, the, they operate predominantly in the masculine space, that the father makes room for them by allowing them to take risks, by allowing them to, you know, go and, and, and essentially be in the world and deal with whatever problems come up. And when you remove fathers from the home, um, which is one of the main things we talk about on this channel, uh, the, the, the boys, they become, well, obviously they become more like their mother because that's who they're going to model their behavior after. But they also don't have that, uh, that father that allows them, you know, the, the freedom to take some risks. And so those boys become risk averse. And, uh, that I think makes them less attractive to women because, Women want to see a man that's taking risks, that's, you know, uh, going out there and trying to engage in, as you described it, self-mastery, which requires some degree of risk. And I think that's where, you know, again, without laying blame, I'm just, that's the cycle, right? And so women try to compensate, so they basically become or try to behave in a more masculine way and they want to exert authority over men and so on and they think that might work but they don't really find those men attractive and the men are struggling with their own masculinity and we're telling them that masculinity is bad that it's destructive that it it's only good for wars and rape and murder and destruction so of course men are because they care about their civilization they're going to try and back away from that as much as possible and I think that's how we're in this mess, as it were. Yeah, I mean, men have been very emasculated to the point that many men are really, um, they're very, very feminine. And they make terrible women just as much as we women make terrible men. Mm -hmm. There's almost, what's almost happening is they're starting to become this total inversion of the, the gender principles. Um, now, it is... You know, I, I don't want to downplay the struggles that men face because they are real. And a lot of men, um, you know, many of them may never overcome these challenges. It's not that they're totally insurmountable, but they are, you know, pretty close to insurmountable in some cases. But if those men can dig deep and find it within themselves to bring that active solar principle within themselves to, to the surface, they can save themselves. Yeah. The problem the problem then for women is that 
what do they do? Because we're, it goes against our essential nature to put that at the forefront. So we're, while men can save themselves, women largely cannot. And mm. I have spent a lot of time thinking about what it, what can women do in that case? Because I get so many messages from women saying like, I don't have a man in my life who provides this, um, you know, what can I do? Because they feel cut off from their own femininity as a result. And, you know, it's, it's a real problem. I mean, I, the ideal situation of course, is to find for a man who's on a heroic path to find a woman who's on a heroic path and, and, you know, they join forces together, but there's so few people like that in the world. What are the odds that you're going to find that person that they're going to be of your age and single and available for you at the same yeah. time? And I mean, it's, it's so difficult. Uh, well, that's true. But I, but I think that those people, you know, they, they are uh, going to have the last laugh. I don't know how else to put it because, you know, we were looking at like, for example, which, in, in the United States, at least, which people are essentially like, you know, that were are probably walking a path like that. I, I've spoken to uh, some uh, Christians and, and uh, pastors and stuff on, on my show, and we uh, have talked about the same kinds of things but because they're 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 framing it in the you know in the biblical way they're saying very similar things to what you're saying uh, and you're taking a much broader spiritual look at this you know uh, but they're saying something very similar so for example they they would say that men are divine and women are earthly and and that was something that i have thought about a lot because I used to be, when I was a kid, I, I loved Greek mythology. And I remember like the, at the very beginning of the, the story of like the gods and the titans, etc., is Uranus, Father Sky, and Gaia, Mother Earth. And they basically came together and they started everything, right? I, I believe that they were the first, I guess you could say, gods uh, of, the, of the Greek um, stories. And when i say that well this is what they they say because they you know christians say uh god made man in his image and then from the man he brought out the woman and the woman is of the earth and um you know there are obviously we need a balance of heaven and earth to you know make it work and i think that they that the woman and the man should have a mission and so the what i think is happening is coming back to what i was saying about the united states is that the people who are who see the world in that way i guess you would call it the natural order you know what they would call man uh, there's god first and then you have man and then you have women and then you have children um if you if you reverse that then essentially you create chaos because then the children become the ultimate authorities and that's kind of what we're seeing now where you know they i mean obviously there are manipulative parents and so on but we seem to be like wanting to entertain every child's desires without considering what the problems might be later on, especially with, for example, transitioning, right? And the mothers claim that they're just supporting their kids. And so you have this inversion of authority. And in many cases, the fathers are not present at all. Um, so I, I find that to be like kind of fascinating. So like, uh, what do you think about that? Like that Gaia Uranus thing? Uh, oh, I, I forgot to mention. So the people who are doing the most multiplying that are ba basically producing the most children and they're the happiest appear to be the Mormons. And then after that, it's like uh, in the United States, it's like, you know, uh, Muslims who also, you know, operate within their own sort of uh, structure. I think the Amish as well. The Amish. Yes. And I've mentioned the Amish multiple times that, you know, not only are they doing really well in terms of like their population and their demographic growth, but they're also super happy. Like I, I live in, I used to live in Chicago and we had to leave because of all the crime and how awful things were. And then I moved to Southwestern Virginia, which is where I am now. And there is an Amish, there are Amish shops in like the next town. And I go there frequently. And those people are some of the nicest, sweetest people ever. Like I, I could just sit there with them quietly and be quite content. So uh, I, I think that Dude, going back to what you're saying, like if, if you live in a big city, you're probably not going to see this. But I think that um, men and women are either, 
you know, they're either learning about these things, maybe in their uh, churches or whatever, or they have an instinct that they're moving towards. And I do think that a lot of these groups like the Mormons, the Amish, the Muslims, even Catholics are, uh, I guess it's it's faith that's guiding them, but but they are making these decisions. They're trying to operate within that and they're reaching for virtue. And I think that, you know, that is promising, you know, so. I mean, it's not as, you know, the, the single mother thing is worse, but at least people are like trying to correct the the make the correct decisions in their own life as individuals, which is all we can do, really. Yeah, well, it is all we can do. I mean, there's an external and an internal and you can only kind of affect your internal sphere of influence. Yeah. I mean, you're going to you're going to set yourself up for disappointment when you start worrying about trying to control things that really aren't within your sphere of influence. Um, but regards to like uh, Uranus and Gaia, you know, the the sky father and mother earth, and um, that is a recurring theme within the world of tradition through these traditional mythologies is this idea that the masculine principle is re represented by something um, airy and um, ephemeral fire sometimes is used too. like you can't actually reach out and touch it. You can sort of feel it's there. You can feel the wind or you can feel the heat or something, but it's not, um, it's lacking in, in material substance. Whereas, you know, the um, water and earth are the kind of the more feminine elements and there you can touch them. They are solid in, in a way. Um, and this is, as I said, it's, it's this recurring theme. And then what you have within the world of tradition is this concept of hierarchy, which is absolutely integral to traditionalism with a capital T um, as, a, you know, as a school of thought. And what, what you have now is this kind of downward democratic leveling of egalitarianism, which strips away the differences of, of everybody as much as possible, including whether you're male or female in some ways. Um, we have the domination of the plebs, the shudras. And, you know, as with any pyramid, it can only balance on its point for so long before it's going to tip back over again onto one of its sides. Mm -hmm. So there's hope in that sense. But, you know, this concept of hierarchy was so important. And men, interestingly, um, were considered to be equivalent to women and children unless they had gone through initiation. And if you did not go through the initiation of your caste or your guild, then you were just not considered a real man. You yeah, were these, like legally uh, yeah. and socially of the same status as a woman. Isn't that yes. interesting? Yeah, I've talked about that too. Uh, for example, I, I want to, well, let me just mention this briefly. I, it's funny because becoming a man uh, is not simply becoming a boy or being a boy and then turning into an adult. Uh, that that like the way that we've thought of manhood or being a man has always had something to do with some kind of rite of passage or some kind of ritual or something, right? Like like uh, they still do this in um, uh, Jewish cultures, right? Like you have to go through your bar mitzvah and that involves these things. And once you've done that, then everyone addresses you differently and now you are officially a man. At least that's how I understand it's supposed to work. Right. And it's meant to, it's meant initially, like it's meant to produce an ontological change. Like it's actually supposed to change something about your nature. And now suddenly mm -hmm. like you have the essence of masculinity actualized within yourself that you are actively embodying, not just as a latent possibility that could be awakened through initiation, but now it's it's this active and virile force that's palpable to people around you and in, in your aura, you know? Yeah, yeah. But we don't have anything. Well, first of all, these rituals for men, they're uh, they're they're very uncommon. I had to you know think about the the bar mitzvah as an example, but but most you know in the secular world we live in and and even like if you include i don't know if they have anything that's like this uh, under any other religions but it seems to me that uh there there is no measure of a man except now it is defined by women's desire so a woman can point at a man and say oh you still live at home with your parents or you know you're you have like a job that pays less than six figures you are not a man 
And so like the the what defines a man is not coming from within or from other men who who might have taken him, you know, during the the time of hunter gatherers, they might have taken him to uh, you know, help hunt an animal and when they came back they say yes, this guy, you know, he speared a uh, you know a buffalo he is a man now and now everyone has to treat him differently right they may even change his name and everything and i i think that um there is something about that that i think men really want that this is why they're so interested in in our modern days in these stories of heroism which are, are also themselves becoming really really rare and you know com almost completely unheard of to be honest and they're all being subverted when we do but i think it is that men are looking for that and so i guess uh i want to know what you think about that but also why isn't there something like this for women well, okay, so let's back up a little bit and I'll try to take it um, in turn. Okay. So in regards to like the initiations that would make you a man, right? What we have left today are very poor imitations of this, just kind of the external trappings that are left. It's sort of an empty shell and it's not actually producing that ontological change. So what we need to ask first and foremost is what actually was involved in initiation that produced this change and how could a man recreate that today on his own? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, so first of all, in order to, to be thought of as a man, I mean, you had to know something and you had to be capable of something and going through initiation is what proved this you, um, you know, you had to have done some study uh, to the, the subjects that are relevant to your station in life, um, often of a spiritual and philosophical nature. Um, initiation often involved having to confront scary things to, um, in many cases, it involved facing death. Um, you know, there, there were initiation rituals that involved basically being like shut into a coffin or set adrift in a boat at night or whatever. And, you know, you could maybe actually die. Right. But mm -hmm. then you emerge and you've, you've spent the night facing your fears. Right. Or sometimes maybe uh, certain psychoactive drugs would have been used to induce a state that would cause you to have to face your inner self. And it is the facing of the inner self that really produces the warrior nature because within yourself, you find the enemy most perfectly suited to you. And it's that inner battle that you have to fight. You know, the Muslims de define this as like the, the inner jihad and the outer G or the greater and the lesser jihad, rather the greater jihad is the one you fight against yourself within your mm. soul. It's the, um, it's being real with yourself, uh, engaging in self-reflection, having a high level of self-awareness and consciousness, being willing to engage with the unpleasant aspects of yourself and work with those, um, learning to conquer the ego and put yourself yeah. in service of a higher principle and not in service of yourself because in some ways men are just as guilty of as women are of serving their own egos and it's largely because people don't know any better they they've never been taught that they should serve anything other than their own egotistical desires um and so if you don't know any better you can't really be faulted for it of course but you know, the true man is going to have conquered his ego, have conquered his desires. This is how he frees himself from the grasp of feminine materiality and becoming and starts becoming a hero, somebody who is godlike and divine and spiritual in many ways. This is how he develops that masculine gravitas. And this is how his solar light starts to shine. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, do women have something similar? Um, typically women were excluded from most initiatic practices. There are some exceptions to this. Um, this is what, you know, when I've been kind of considering, you know, a path forward for women, um, that we could take on our own independent of men that I, I keep running up against the problem that there just isn't a lot of material on what women can do because it was never really considered a, an issue in the world of tradition. And these texts, these, these old texts that speak to what men should do were written for a different age mm -hmm. and they are still applicable to men in many ways. But when it comes to women, it was just kind of assumed that men were doing their part. And so women just naturally fell into line as a result. And so they don't really address the situation that we have today adequately, um, in my view. And so what I keep finding is like, well, what if a woman wanted to become her own stable access? Because when there's no, 
when there's no man in your life who embodies sufficiently the Shiva principle, the masculine principle, then all that's left is to submit directly to Shiva, to God. Um, and you know, how, how does a woman do that without doing violence to her own femininity? Because it's not appropriate for a woman to be an ascetic or a warrior. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it, it then starts to strengthen that, that masculine aspect in her, but in a way that suppresses the feminine. And this is, this isn't going to work because it's going to bring us right back to where we are today. Yeah. You know what, but whenever you indulge, you know, when a woman indulges in, in her femininity too much into the sexual, sensual, generative, naturalistic aspect of her being without the solar principle there, it becomes very destructive. Mm -hmm. And so I have, this is a problem I have yet uh, to resolve and will probably require years of research and thinking, but you know, I, I don't profess to have all the answers. I, I would say there's a lot more answers available for men at this juncture than there are for women, which is, you know, both a good and a bad thing. Because, you know, if men were to were to follow the guidelines of the world of tradition and, and reclaim that masculinity, then it would um, it would remove the problem of what do we do about women? Yeah. But yeah. Um, in the absence of that, and I, I don't expect that to happen in the Kali Yuga because we're just... Um, you know, we're just simply at a, at a natural stage of decline in civilization. It's just simply part of the the cycle and the seasons that we go through. Yeah, uh, I know that I'm gonna get a lot of comments uh, regarding the use of the word tradition, especially when you say capital T tradition, right? Yeah, and we the do reason have to make a distinction. Yeah, we, the reason for this that I think it's 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 something we should address is that. Um, Maybe you will disagree, but I believe that most people who call themselves traditional uh, or, you know, maybe even conservative, although I know that that word has a lot of like political, I don't know, baggage that comes with it. And I, I just don't think it's, it's easy to talk about because there's a lot of presumptions that come from that. But um, I don't believe that most people who say the word traditional or pretend to be trad or trad cons actually are. I think that um, they're operating in the shadow of something that, you know, meant something very different. It's sort of like how if I say the word chivalry, people assume or they jump to this conclusion that it's about how men treat women. And I think that chivalry exists completely separate from gender but some of the things that we consider to be you know chivalry today which is how men treat women um are are actually just like how men treat their society and and you know perhaps like there's there's more it, it's a lot deeper than that does that make sense yes um yeah. so when we talk about the world of tradition and the traditionalism, the capital T traditionalism that's associated with that. The world of tradition is essentially like a platonic world of forms. Like it's a metaphysical thing. Whether or not it actually was physically manifested on this earth is, you know, we can never really know. My feeling is probably it wasn't because I don't believe that perfection could be physically manifested in material reality. Um, there will always be something imperfect about it, which is, which is in itself the seeds of the decline that has to happen. This entropy is a natural part of materiality. So when we talk about like lowercase t traditionalism and trads and trad cons and stuff, it's, um, you know, I, that's not something I identify with or want to have any part of. There is a sense of LARPing going on there. And it's this sort of egoistic grasping at. Yes. Some, it's uh, very material too. Yeah, 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 it's it's, like, it's a well, surf. If I put on well, if I put on the 1950s dress and the pearls, I'm trad. Look at me. Yeah, I'm at home yeah. cooking, and I'm gonna make my cooking videos on YouTube and all that. It's like, but it's where's the inner essence? It's it's mm -hmm. just a hollow shell in many cases because the the values. It's it's not about what you look like. It's not about what you are doing externally because that should be something that flows on naturally from what is internal to you. And if you haven't embodied it internally, then it is just a costume. It is just a LARP. And I mean, to some extent, yeah, they're grasping at something that, you know, they probably kind of like atavistically and never experienced being true or something that is desirable and that 
uh, they feel a longing for, and they don't know how else to in incorporate in that into their life except through the external trappings of it. Um, so it's at least a starting point. Like I'm not going to, um, even though I don't think it's, um, like, it's not a bad thing, but it's not a good thing. It's just, um, not enough. it's just not, it's just not, it's not correct. It's right. not the correct, um, path to be taking, but at least they are at the stage where they recognize this and it's better than being a complete degenerate. Like I'd much rather see people doing the LARPing at the trad stuff than just being a total modern degenerate doing whatever pride parades or that they're doing yeah. um you know like yeah. there's there's degrees here but the thing is that if you want to be trad on the outside then it authentically has to flow from what you've internalized what are your values and your virtues so you know if you're um if you're a woman, is that flowing from your own healthy relationship with your own femininity, um, your own devotional nature, your, your Venusian nature? Um, you know, are you living a healthy and pure lifestyle or is it all about just what it looks like and what you can put on Instagram? Right. And for men, it's like, are you just going to the gym and, and getting big muscles and saying, look at me, I'm, a, I'm a man, or have you actually, um, conquered your ego, mastered yourself, mastered your urges, and you're, you're internally self-sufficient and self-possessed. And in many cases, you know, the answer is no. Instead, what you see are guys with big muscles who have roid rage. Like, yeah. I mean, just as an example, right. I'm not saying every guy's like that. Um, and I do encourage men to go to the gym. Why men go to the gym is like, well, are you developing self-discipline? Is that habit of going to the gym part of an overall healthy lifestyle is this part of the conquering of yourself that you're doing where you get up and go to the gym at six in the morning even when you don't feel like it because you know you have to do this for yourself or is it about having the big muscles that you can take pictures of and show off to other people like right. there's a difference there it's not about the external it's not about going to the gym it's about why you go and what it's doing to you on an ontological inner level you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah, it reminds me of the uh I think he might have been from India, but I'm not sure, but there was a man who got a he wanted to be muscular. Uh because he thought it would make him look ma more masculine and he got these insane injections in his biceps and and you know, his arms and his shoulders and it, you know, all over his body, even his pecs. Like he got these crazy injections. They were like it was like a woman getting you know, cosmetic surgery to make her chest bigger, right? But he did it for his muscles. And well, it, it doesn't, it looks terrifying. Like I think he's probably gonna get cancer and die. Um, but it's coming from that desire to, you know, essentially embrace what they believe in a, is an aesthetic of femininity or masculinity but they don't know that it doesn't come simply because you're buying different clothes or you bought an expensive car or you know you are taking steroids or whatever it has to be like a desire to do so for its own sake if that makes sense like oh i want to be healthier because i want to be more fit because i want to you know essentially like make my take control of my life which it sounds weird but i think that uh, if you can do that, you're actually going to be more free, right? Than if you uh, avoid th that. So it's like it requires discipline to achieve that that sense of liberty or freedom. If that makes sense. Right. I mean, real freedom doesn't come from just having no responsibilities or being licentious. Right. Right. Um, that's just a pathway to becoming enslaved by your senses, essentially. Your passions, um, right. Real, yeah, it, it, it only appeals to the appetitive nature in man. Real freedom comes when you have the self-discipline to build um, a foundation for yourself on which you can put down the roots of something greater. And mm -hmm. too many modern people think that freedom means just doing whatever you feel like doing, not... Um, not the freedom to not be enslaved by your senses. Like, for example, people who can't start their day without coffee, right? And if they don't have coffee, they start to get a headache, they get cranky because they're having caffeine withdrawal. Like, you're a slave to coffee. You will feel bad if you don't indulge in that. Um, I saw, you know, um, 
Well, like take, for example, like somebody who goes to the gym to work out a lot just so they can eat whatever they want, right? You're cultivating self-discipline in one area so that you can indulge in another. Well, that's not going to produce the ontological change to be a man, right? Because Mm. what you're really doing is you're, you're making a trade so that you can indulge these sense pleasures when what you should be doing is going to the gym because it makes you healthier in body, mind, and soul, and then eating a really healthy diet on top of it. Um, for the same because, reason. Yeah. I mean, these, the things that we do in our day-to-day lives will be reflected in our, in our outward appearance and mannerisms. It reflects the state of our soul in many ways. And, um, you know, I think that's something that, you know, the, like the, the, the trad LARPers need to be mindful of. It's like, if you actually want to embody that, then you need to live in a way that's consistent with that. And what we come, the problem we come up against is like, you know, people who say they want to go back to the 1950s or to the Roman empire or whatever, like those were a different kind of people. Right. Yeah. Like I was just thinking the other day. So like I had like, just kind of like a rainy, lazy day and I was watching, um, uh, the three lives of Thomasina, which is a really cute little Disney movie that was made in like the fifties or sixties. I just, I loved it as a kid. And I just, somebody suggested it to me and I just started watching it. And I was like struck by how differently the children and, and, and even the adults, but especially the way the children behave, the way the boys acted and talked to each other. And it's like, kids are so different from that now. And it's like, Mm -hmm. so we've got a different kind of mentioned material from each generation to the next. And there's been actually quite a rapid degeneration. Um, We are not the people of the fifties. We are not the people of the Roman empire. And we cannot recreate that because we are not the same kind of people. Our society reflects the kind of people we collectively are, and we will not fix society until we fix ourselves like I know a lot of people like to um rip on Jordan Peterson but he does get a lot of things right in some ways and when he you know when he said you know people think that they're going to go out and fix the world when they can't even you know clean their room and it was it was a really like obvious but yet somehow profound statement that I think many people never really stop to think about it's like well how can you fix anybody when you can't even fix yourself And this is, you know, this is the issue with the gender wars. Everybody wants to try to fix the other side rather than just focusing on themselves. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. and in many cases, you'll have, um, you know, whether it's feminists or MGTOWs or whatever, people refusing to better their own lives until the world is perfect for their group. And it's like, but why, why go down with everybody else? Like, you, you know, you can still work towards making things better for your group and also improve your own life and carve out a little bit of happiness for yourself by doing the work on yourself that every single one of us as individuals needs to do in this lifetime. Yeah, well, you know, it's good that you mentioned that because that lets me segue into uh, what I think is a, a means that we can help People. So one of the things that I strongly have been encouraging is that men uh, should try to congregate and meet up with other men that, that, you know, especially if they're different age ranges. Like if you have older men who have, you know, they have more life experience, they may be able to share, share some wisdom, some mentorship to younger men who didn't, you know, they didn't have a father, which is like a growing you know, problem with a lot of young men today. Uh, they're lost. They're trying to, you know, they may be stuck in a in a uh, a state of adolescence. You know, playing video games, watching porn, but they're not happy and they want to make that better. And so I think other men can help those men. It's not to say that women couldn't do it, but I think that men need to create fraternity with men. And so one of the things that I uh, promote is that you know, if any men that if you know people in your area, maybe meet up with them, something like that, you know. Uh, I am in a men's group that uh, we we help men achieve goals. We start with small things, you know, like there's one guy who's trying to quit drinking. And so, you know, we, we don't pretend to be experts. It's, we're not, you know, an Alcoholics Anonymous, but um, we, as men, we just try to offer, you know, some suggestions. And I think that uh, and, and it could be for anything. We try to help guys accomplish their goals. And it's one of the things that we do here at Honey Badger Radio. We have a Discord group people can join and, you know, they can talk to each other about their problems, about their worries. And if they have questions, you know, there's so much that men and women 
are not uh, prepared for because we haven't had that kind of community, right? And what I have noticed is there, like I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of women who are also doing something like this. They're trying to create uh, camaraderie or um, connections with women. They're doing it online. Maybe it's not easy for them to do it at home. Maybe they don't have a church or maybe they don't like any of the churches around here because, you know, in near their home because there's a lot of progressivism that's in them and they're trying to stay away from that. Um, and I, I'm seeing this as like a growing thing, especially with women. Uh, there is a, for example, uh, there is a YouTuber named Jennifer Molesky who talks a lot about men, but her audience is almost com all men. And the problem with that is that I think that she's trying to talk to women. And so uh, I've, and I think that that should happen. Like I, I guess that in ancient times or what have you, uh, and you, you lived in a village, there were older women who would pass their wisdom on to younger women. And so, you know, you would have that, I think. And that might be the closest thing to something like a, you know, the same kind of fraternity that men would engage in. So uh, have you thought about that? Like, I don't because, you, you know, you're a woman, too. And I think that you have a lot to offer. And I think that uh, other women would probably be very interested. I don't know what your audience demographic is, but. Well, my audience is mostly male, but I do have a fair number of women. I mean, YouTube is, is just itself a more male dominated platform anyway. I do try to make content specific to women just because the revolt series is very male oriented. Like, um, you know, the world of tradition is very centered around the idea of the sacred king as the apex of the traditional hierarchy. And I mean, the sacred king is essentially like the ultimate archetype of absolute man. If you wanna know what it is to be a man, go watch the revolt series and pay attention, especially to the stuff about sacred Kings and Aragorn. what Evola has to say about that. But you're um, yeah. Aragorn becomes a sacred King in the end. That was his mm -hmm. destiny. He didn't, he, he didn't want it initially, but once he accepted it, once he accepted his destiny, then yes, he became a sacred King. The white tree of Gondor came back to life. Um, I think episode three, I actually specifically talk about that. Mm. Um, the episode called regality. Um, this next, was the like, next episode he, we have coming, we'll talk a lot about Kings as well. So yeah, it, it was like, he we wasn't come back to that. He avoided it, but I think it was because he wasn't ready yet. And so when he was ready, then it was time, if that makes sense. But that's, that's what I thought. Yeah. He kind of had to mature into the role. And in some ways, like the whole battle for middle earth was sort of like his initiation to prove to himself that he could do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know what, what you see, about Aragorn is he he's a natural leader he's a reluctant leader but he is always going around he's lifting everyone else up he's giving them hope um you know he in Rohan he's not the king there but even the king is coming to him for advice and counsel and he's encouraging him you know ride out let's uh if we have to die then let's die fighting and you know he's just always um inspiring others to fulfill their roles in very healthy ways Mm -hmm. And so it is through doing that. And I think the process of just seeing that, you know, he can even uh, get the very belligerent undead army to bow to him and keep their word to him. And, you know, when, when he finally retakes the throne of Gondor, he's ready to be a king. He's, he's stepped into that role fully. Um, and I agree with what you're saying that, you know, men do need other association with, with men, um, good association is absolutely essential on a spiritual path. To some extent, it's like you, only you can walk your path in some ways. It's a very solitary and internal thing at, on the other hand, though, you need people around you who can support you and who can encourage yeah. you and who, because it's not all like, it's not all fun and games. And sometimes you stumble and sometimes you fail and sometimes things aren't going your way and you need people to help you out. And in turn, you help them out. So, you know, we need each other, but we also have to be self-sufficient as well. Um, and, you know, in that sense, I mean, I know a lot of like the MGTOW community like dislikes me for reasons that I think are just based on misunderstandings about my actual positions, but I'm actually quite an advocate of MGTOW um, mm. and, and also women going their own way as well. Like I think both men and women just need to remove themselves from the toxic dynamic between the sexes and spend time building themselves up um, 
as an individual. And, you know, it's, um, if you want to like, like, as we said earlier, you know, from a civilizational standpoint, everything's kind of a disaster, but from the individual standpoint, you do still have the choice to remain standing amidst the ruins or be dragged along into the abyss. You know, what are you going to choose? That's going to require you to think for yourself to kind of culturally filter what you allow into your mind to be very discriminating about the people that you choose to invest your time into and allow into your life. And, you know, if you do all that, then, then on the other side of that, um, you know, maybe you end up finding somebody you want to have a relationship with, but it's, it's good for men, especially in their twenties, um, to take some time, just not thinking about women, not worrying about women, focus on mastering themselves, focus on mastering themselves, especially so that they are not, um, easy prey for women seeking to test out their sexual power because young women, especially at that age, like they're very drunk on their newfound sexual power. They're just kind of coming in, they're blossoming into womanhood and realizing that they're pretty and attractive to boys. And, um, it's really best, I think at that age for the sexes to be a little bit more separate than they currently are, because men need to focus on building themselves up to withstand that temptation. And women need to be removed from the constant attention that they're getting for just simply being pretty. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I, I think that the majority of, uh, to be, to be uh, honest, I believe that the majority of MGTOW are doing exactly that. Uh, And the, the, but the ones we hear from, you know, the ones that are vocal and critical and so on. I, I don't I don't think they've started that because that was the purpose of, from my understanding, that was the purpose of, of going MGTOW was to essentially say, I need to unplug myself from women. I need to work on myself and I need to like, you know, focus on that. And yeah, I mean, maybe some of them are swearing off women forever, but it doesn't really matter then. Like if, you know, if, if whatever it is they do, um, But I think that there are some who aren't quite ready to let go, but they want to hold on to this label like it's some kind of security blanket. And I don't mean this with, you know, to piss off any MGTOW that might be watching, but I think you know what I mean. If you're if you're talking about women all the time and talking about how much you don't want to be around them, then you're not really doing like work like you're not doing the appropriate amount of self work, which because if you were, then you wouldn't be concerned with all that. Right. So. Yeah. I mean, if women are living rent free in your head, you're not really going your own way. And that would be the antithesis of a heroic path. Whereas if you um, are doing kind of a more complete version of MGTOW, actually going your own way, really just not paying attention to women at all. um, That is actually kind of a heroic path in some ways. And that's that tends to be what I advocate. Like, um, when I speak to like young men and stuff who come to talk to me, they're like, they come for an astrological consultation or they're just sending me a message or whatever. Like, I'm always kind of saying like, look, you're at the age where you really just need to focus on yourself and stop worrying about girls because yeah. it's just like, it just holds them back. They spend so much time and energy worrying about girls that they're not putting that into building themselves up. And that, that bill comes due in your thirties. Yeah, for sure. And it comes even more due in your 40s if you can kick the mm -hmm. can down the road that long. But eventually that bill comes due. And it's much better to have done this work on yourself at a young age um, than it is to try to postpone it. And I mean, Mm -hmm. I understand that... um, a lot of men are very, uh, very traumatized by their experiences with women. And, you know, there's, you got to find a way to heal from that. And, and part of that might just be going your own way and not thinking about women and not, the thing is, it's like, once you start seeing yourself as a victim, it's a really, it's really hard to get out of that because you become, you become over identified with having given yourself that label and you start to lose sight of your, who you are as a man. And the problem of course, is we've already identified is men already start life off, not knowing what it is to be a man. But once you put yourself in a victim status, it's even harder to see. It becomes, uh, the path forward becomes very obscured. Um, You know, if you're going to practice some kind of MGTOW pathway, then I think the question you need to ask is, is this conducive to helping you build the type of man that you want to be? And more importantly, do you know what type of man you want to be? Have you clearly defined that? Because if... If it's simply something that's reactionary to the trauma you've experienced from women, that's not really helping you be the kind of man you want to be unless the man you want to be is, uh, is a victim, essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's not, 
it's not get, getting you back in touch with that masculine principle and that feeling of self-sufficiency. It's not putting you back in touch with the sort of virile sense of power that you just have innately. So, um, you know, MGTOW should be something that helps you become the man you want to be. And if you don't have that clearly defined goal, then what it turns into is just like a self-pity party. Um, so yeah. be spending more time thinking about what it is to be a man than what you don't like about women. Be really clear on what the end goal is that you're seeking in the way that you're living your life. And that's when the pieces fall into place because I think so many people like men or women, it doesn't matter. Most, most people seem to go through life without a defined end goal as to what they're working towards. They're just taking it day by day. They're very reactive to the things that happen to them. Um, they're very much at, just kind of at the mercy of the pull of fate in some ways. And if you don't have a clear goal for what you're working towards, well, you're certainly never going to get there. Um, and what yeah. happens is you just end up on a very reactionary path and your life just starts to look like a leaf pushed around by a stream. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I, I think, like I said, I think most men are doing that. Uh, some just need more encouragement. Uh, I do agree that like a MGTOW lifestyle is heroic. Um, if it's uh, again, if it's all about, like focus on the self. And the thing is, is that the longer you do that, uh, the better you are going to be at discernment when it comes to your friends, your uh, the women that might come into your life, you're gonna be better at determining, you know, whether or not they are virtuous, right? Uh, and I think it's going to completely alter that. So um, I have a couple of super chats. We're a little over time. I, I apologize if you, you know, you if no you ha have like some something else to do, but I am enjoying this conversation. I hope that yeah, me too. you are too. Cool. Um, so I wanted to, I have a couple of super chats, but I wanted to mention one other thing. You talked about uh, in the video about masculinity. Uh, you mentioned that uh, men have to or should serve or operate in service to a principle. You know, uh, and and you you also talked a little bit about these two primary archetypes. So there there might be more. Maybe I misunderstood it, but you mentioned the ascetic or the ascetic, and the warrior. And of course, there are parallels to again Lord of the Rings. Like you know, in your example, you said that uh, Aragorn is the warrior, Gandalf is the ascetic, and there are sort of twisted versions of those you know, in um, in the story, like Saruman is like an ascetic that's essentially uh, become obsessed with power. And on the other side, I think it's Boromir um, who falls, right? So what are, first of all, uh, briefly, what are those archetypes? What do they represent for men? And secondly, uh, what are the virtues? Because I think there might be men who are curious about this. Like, what is a virtue they can serve? Because I think it is the thing that prevents them from ultimately just serving women. Yeah, and this is, uh, you know, this is fundamentally a product of uh, a society that's become very materialistic and atheistic. So, um, the ascetic is, you know, is basically like your monk, your intellectual, your contemplative type. The warrior is pretty self-explanatory. That's the path of action. So, you know, the two heroic paths for men are either the path of contemplation and the path of action. Um, this is pretty consistent throughout um, traditional schemes. Now, we're on a higher plane action and contemplation are non-different. On the metaphysical plane, they are essentially like knowledge and action find their synthesis. And this is what the sacred king actually embodies. That's why I say he's the ultimate archetype for men. If you want to look at what it means to be a man, the synthesis of ascetic and warrior come together in the sacred king. He, um, he can have the idea and he can manifest it in the world. Um, I'll be, I'll be going in into depth in that in the next revolt episode, because it's all about the kind of relationship between the ascetic and the warrior and who takes primacy and how, what that means for the king. Um, so what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> uh, no, uh, the, the principle that men have right. to serve oh, yes, a yes, principle, yes. right? So yeah, what is the principle to serve? Well, the short answer is God. Um, mm -hmm. The short answer is, you know, Dharma, Logos, order, um, hierarchy. These, um, these sacred traditional principles that keep chaos at bay, that bring the sacred down into the profane and make it imminent. That is, these are the ideals that men should be working for. 
it's very, very hard in my opinion. I mean, I'm, I'm open to being proven wrong, but I don't know that you would have a lot of success on these paths. If you are committed to atheism, Mm -hmm. you have, you almost have to have a belief in a higher power and an ordering principle in the cosmos, um, in order to find you know, like what, what should your orientation be? If you, if you don't have that, then you have nothing else to orient towards except materiality, which is under the domain of the feminine. And then you Mm -hmm. worship women. And Mm -hmm. so I don't like, just from a philosophical standpoint, I have a very difficult time conceiving of a way in which a man who doesn't believe in a higher power could embody either of these archetypes fully. I Mm -hmm. think eventually you come up to a stopping point. You'll end up like Jordan Peterson, who, you know, in some ways he's kind of an ascetic type, but because he just can't break out of his material liberalism, he's, he just gets stuck and he can't go any further. And we all saw the end result of that with his very public, um, breakdown and, you know, that, there comes a point where you just can't go further if you're not willing to just not only accept that there's a God, but submit yourself to God. This is something I talk about a lot in my Bhagavad Gita streams, which, um, you know, you don't have to be a follower of Vedic philosophy to understand them. I'm trying to just kind of distill the principles down in a way that can be useful to anybody. And the Bhagavad Gita is all about action versus contemplation and what is their proper role in relation to each other and how do you um embody that in your life and it's all about this idea that in the end you know you really just have to submit to god and leave it in god's hands and your job is just to do your dharmic duty you do what's right because it's right not because you're hoping to get something from it and there's a lot of really good little gems in the Bhagavad Gita about what it means to be a man and specifically a warrior, because it's kind of a handbook for the warrior. And I think um, for, especially for men in the West, there tends to be more of a predominating warrior strain as opposed to an aesthetic strain. And so I feel like that's part of the reason I chose it was that I felt like it had a lot to say that is actually very relevant to Western modern man. Yeah, I think the ascetic there, uh, obviously, we have this thing where we're in love with intellectualism. And I think that that is a kind of like, dark reflection of the ascetic ness. It, it's the Saruman thing, right? Where, where mm-hmm. Saruman is like a college professor. He thinks he knows better than everyone else. He doesn't take into account uh, a kind of divine infinite outside of himself, right? And and that's why uh, he ultimately believes that, you know, he is so intelligent, so educated, that he can take the ring and defeat Sauron and take over himself, right? And, and that, of course, uh, leads to his downfall. So I think that that, again, I'm not, I don't know if, if I'm, on the mark or close but i think that the um that we do have a, a people that might have fall, followed the ascetic path but they're all like these you know snobbish elitist academics that that believe that they understand the world better than anyone and that's why they believe they can engineer it and control yep. it i think you're absolutely on the mark with that because if you don't accept god then of course if you're not worshiping women you're worshiping your own intellect or you're worshiping Mm -hmm. money and power and it all becomes this material temporal stuff that you get sucked into as being the be all and end all of your your existence and you know even as we saw with saruman you know he thought he could use the the power for good and it just ended up corrupting him much like boromir thought he could take the ring and use it to save gondor it it would have just corrupted him he nearly wanted to kill frodo over it Um, Mm -hmm. you know, and once, once you go down that path, it's very hard to come back and you're not like asceticism is like, it actually just the last chapter I was doing on the Bhagavad Gita just a few days ago was kind of warning against approaching spirituality purely from intellectualism. Like there is a point at which you have to just experience it and embody it. You cannot, it's not something that can be apprehended purely through cognitive processes. And that kind of obsession with theoretical knowledge for knowledge's own sake can be very dangerous. This is kind of the corrupted ascetic, Mm -hmm. much as we have corrupted warriors who are basically just Mm -hmm. mercenaries for hire or thugs, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. And of course, a lot of them believe that they're serving 
uh, something necessary or even good that they themselves are heroic, but uh, they're very obviously Very easy like, to rationalize it. Yeah, it's very easy to rationalize, exactly. All right, so I got some super chats. I'm gonna read through them really quick. Uh, again, thank you so much. This is uh, this is the kind of stuff that I like to talk about when it comes to um, men and women, because I think that we may, we may have lost, I think we've lost uh, what it means to be a man and to be a woman. And I think that most people who are trying to like define it are looking at the world around them. But I think that that uh, the world around us doesn't reflect it and probably hasn't for a very long time. Um, all right. So Zeranx gives us 10 bucks and says, can it be said that men and women are like yin yang mirror solar panel entities? Uh, men shine the light and what women reflect spurs us on, but that's not an adequate measure of the light we give out because women must also be able to absorb that light to fulfill late, their later matriarchal duties in guiding others after we men pass. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it makes sense. So, you know how, how we were talking about how, you know, the moon reflects the light of the sun, right? Mm -hmm. Um well, what does the moon do? The moon has long been thought to transmit the light of not just the sun, but all the other planets to transmit it down to earth. And we're considered here on earth to be part of the sublunary sphere. And so the sun transmits its light to the moon and the moon distributes and disseminates that light. And so how does that um, have a knock on effect, you know, in human relationships, the man functions as the sun, he's putting his light out there, the woman takes that light, she's transmitting it to her children, to her community, um, to her extended family. And so that's a way in which, um, you know, the moon is, is often associated in, in certain types of astrology with being uh, emblematic of the masses of people or of the city or of the queen, right? Mm. And so there's this very civic mindedness to the light of the moon. And that's what women need to be doing. Like, it's not enough to just absorb the light of the man, but you have to reflect it back out and distribute it to everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for the super chat. Very uh, interesting. You know, it's funny. I, I, when I think of the moon, um, what pops into my head are endless feminist thought pieces about the moon and its relationship to women have you have you ever seen that stuff where yes. you know they, they yeah i mean i guess we maybe we used it to sort of determine when women were uh you know de depending on what cycle they were in or something and, and then they would like talk about it like it would affect their mood and everything else and i just thought it was kind of interesting because i i think in many ways like we didn't bring up feminism in the show today uh we're obviously very critical of it on our on our show normally but we also believe that in in some ways it's it's not a new idea it's basically very old ideas that are repackaged and and uh, women are using them against men. They're they're essentially asking men to do what women have always asked men to do, which is protect women. And they're just using this ideology as the framing for that. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Uh, there you go. So Amasang gives us $2 and says, new idea for a D&D character, the acidic ascetic. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for that. Uh, okay, so I guess we can wrap this up. I really, you know, again, I thought this was fascinating. Uh, I like your content quite a bit. I look forward to seeing more. And, um, uh, well, I guess maybe tell everyone where they can find you if they're interested in, in your videos or, or maybe you have a blog or, or anything like that. Yeah, most of my content is on my YouTube channel, Philosophicat. Um, I do have a Telegram channel. I have a Facebook page where I post updates and stuff. I've been banned off of Twitter recently. And oh, I don't think I... I'm going to be getting my account back. So uh, I'll give up <laughs> on that one. Um, apparently, uh, the what if whole it, free speech if, revolution didn't happen. What if, uh, did, did Elon Musk not buy it yet? You might get it back. I don't know. Yeah, I don't um, know if that deal is going to go through or not, but we'll see. I suspect yeah. I was banned when some disgruntled employee decided to do a bit of house cleaning before getting fired. I don't know. Um, Cause it was for a tweet that was like actually already quite old and oh. it's just like, okay, that's a little bit weird. And it wasn't even like, I'm like, I could think of a hundred tweets I've made that are edgier and more offensive than that one. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, but whatever, you know, it is what it is. So Telegram and, and Facebook and YouTube, um, all of my videos mirror to BitChute and Odyssey automatically. So if you don't like YouTube, there are alternatives. Um, I have uh, my website, astrologicat.com, but that's astrology stuff, which may not be particularly interesting to your audience. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I, I, I think that we have some, we have all kinds on our, on our, uh, in our audience. So, uh, Josh Chasen, I, I forgot that there was, I got rumble open and we got a rumble rant, uh, gave us a dollar and said, society itself is a privilege. It's all sides that don't recognize this is why we are losing it. But I, I, it's a little weirdly worded, but I think I know what he means. Uh, so living in a society is a privilege. All sides don't recognize this privilege, which is why we're losing it. Well, again, that I think that comes from people being born into modernity without uh, essentially being like taught that it they that they are living in the despite everything. It's probably still you know one of the most, if not the most fortunate period to be alive at least so far right so and again where do they get that resentment from well i think they they get it at home first all right so thank you for that i don't know if you have thoughts on that but it i do think it's fairly manufactured but then people internalize it and they they don't realize that it originally came from outside of them yeah and i think once you spend some time kind of investigating that and investigating yourself, you come to realize, you know what, this thought didn't actually come from me. And it came from way far back in my childhood. And it's not necessarily one that I want to keep in my head. Yeah, when you mentioned that, uh, you know, we were talking about MGTOW guys uh, a little bit. And you mentioned that a, a lot of men have been, uh, you know, traumatized by women. I think that most of that my suspicion of course it's not going to be easy to find like a study that'll demonstrate this because we're not interested in doing studies on this kind of thing but i think that most of that comes from mothers and i, I think that fathers uh in the home are a bit of a, a bulwark against that and if you take a father out then a woman is more likely to abuse her children uh, especially if they're boys because you know they they you need, uh, I think, a man to regulate the behavior of boys so they don't become uh, delinquent, basically. So, yeah, I agree. It's probably something I'll touch on in the video I'm working on about, uh, you know, kind of the feminine subversion, because I kind of want to look at both the ways in which an Aphrodite and a Demeter type can be degraded and then start to subvert the nature of man. Um, not that men aren't also degraded and can subvert women. Well, they, yeah, they have their own ways. Sure. You know, sure. I, as I said, I try to make content that's a little bit more female oriented sometimes. And it's kind of like, well, I'm not a man. I'm limited in my capacity in which I can actually speak effectively about men's issues. Like I can speak about it from a theoretical standpoint, but I'm not actually a man. I don't know what it's like to physically be a man and to live like that. So I feel like I can speak a little bit better to women and you know, for myself, I'm like, well, I've got to pay attention to how I'm behaving around men. This is something I can actively teach to other women and actually speak about it with some, you know, level of experience behind it. So, um, I try to, I try to do that where I can and try to encourage other women to be mindful of these things too, because, you know, it's, it's kind of like how, uh, everybody's like, well, just teach men not to rape girls rather than don't teach girls how to dress modestly and have self-respect, right? Like there's mm -hmm. this sense that men have to have all the responsibility for how women behave or don't behave or what happens to women. It's like, we do have agency. We need to learn that. And, you know, we need to be mindful of these things too. And we need to be very mindful of the fact that, you know, we can be a source of corruption for men and, if we're not careful about that, then yeah, we are acting as agents of, dis of destruction. We Men are not perfect human beings and we can't expect them to perfectly withstand the onslaught of feminine chaos 24 mm -hmm. seven indefinitely. Mm -hmm. Eventually the men in your life are going to stumble and falter if you are constantly just throwing chaos at them and trying to subvert and undermine their higher principle. And a lot of women don't realize that they're doing this because it's just something that's natural to femininity, right? Um, so I try to I try to draw awareness to it anyway, as, as yeah. much as I can. <laughs> no, it, it's it's great. I'm glad that you're thinking about these things too, because 
you know, I I hear uh, from a lot of well, some conservatives are more fundamentalist Christian types, and they and they they see all of these problems that are going on, and I believe that the root of everything else comes from the relationship between men and women. If that if if they can be uh, partners again, you know, if they can be if they can work together and and uh, build a healthy you know uh, relationship, whether that means it's cooperative or complementary, or if it's simply the man takes charge, whatever, I don't really care how it works out. I think that most of our other sort of social problems will just melt away. I think that a lot of them are coming from the problems between men and women. And what I hear from some, uh, like there was this guy named Douglas Wilson who runs a website called Canon Press, and I believe that he's like, you know, a, a pastor or something. And he basically said that, it, uh, but what he believes is that if men, the only way this is going to be set right is if men just take charge and go and do it, right? And that the women will just follow. And I'm not really sure that that's true because if those men were like the great men of old, sure. But I, I think that most men are lost and broken and damaged and abused and traumatized. And so that's, I don't think it's that easy. So I'm a little bit like, I get that and I think that, you know, there might be something to it, but the problem is is that we're not considering the state of, you know, young men today and what we are asking of them. And and we're also doing it in a way without like offering them, you know, like the support that they might need, like the hand up and like the encouragement and so on. And uh so yeah, I mean there there's definitely this notion that like, well, if we're going to do this, we have to operate within the natural order, the hierarchy. Men have to be the ones to do it because women will never do it. And yet we have given women like, you know, tremendous amounts of authority in our Which isn't it, working out very well. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. And so, you know, I mean, in some ways, it's kind of the problem. If you've got men saying, well, I'm going to check out of society until feminism is fixed and women start behaving, it's kind of like, but letting women take charge of anything hasn't really worked out so well so you sure you want to let women sort this out yeah and are they going to if they're already satisfying their own ego because that that's the thing is that most women are just doing what they think is best for them in the moment and i think that's because they have their own you know things that they're dealing with their own trauma they may not even be aware of whatever and so they're acting in completely well it's like it's like they have the vote right and men have the vote. So men and women both have the vote. But men, and, I, and I, I'm going to bring up uh, you know, my own personal experience with this. I remember when I was about to turn 18, and this was in the 80s, uh, and there were these commercials that would come on every, like all year round, essentially. I think it was close to fall. They would say, you know, if you're a male and you're about to turn 18, you have to register for selective service. It is the law, right? You can't vote without it. It's the law. And it was terrifying because, you know, we were in the middle of the Cold War. And so I was worried that if I like signed up for selective service that I was going to get drafted. And of course, we had a draft very recently, you know, for for Vietnam and, and you know, whatever else. Right. So as a man, when I got my right to vote well i wouldn't call it a right the responsibility to vote um i was scared like i thought to myself well maybe i shouldn't register you know like i i debated not registering but then i was afraid well the you know that they could throw me in jail i was 18 years old i didn't really know right so i registered and because of that just simply knowing that i could get that i could get drafted and sent off to war that made me a lot more engaged in who I was going to vote for. It made it a big part of it, right? I don't want to vote for a war, you know, some warmonger or something. I don't want to vote for something that's going to cause problems because, you know, my life could be on the line. And so I, I was very cognizant of what I was doing in terms of that sphere. But we don't do that for women at all. Like women just get the vote. And so what do they do with it? Well, they vote for stuff they want. And this is like the this is the conflict unless those women are in like if those women are married to men and they have children, then they're the way that they vote is completely different. But if they're, you know, on the government dole or they're like, you know, they're a single mom, they get paid by, by the state, whatever they got, whatever, then they're just going to vote for stuff they want. And that's why 
you know, people in politics pander to women far more than they do men because if they promise the women free stuff, then women are more likely to vote for them. So we, we've encouraged this in women. This is what I'm getting at, right? We've never said, like, you know, you have a tremendous impact on the future of our society based on something as simple as how do you vote? Uh, but but anyway, that those are just my quick thoughts on that. So No, I agree. Well, there's very little reward for women to behave in any kind of traditional feminine capacity. There's very little reward in modern society at all for anybody to behave virtuously. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure I could get a lot more views or make a lot more money if I were being sexually provocative on my channel than just simply talking about philosophical ideas, right? Like yeah, sure. there are material rewards that come for a woman massaging her own vanity and ego or her selfish desires for material things, you know, there's, but if you actually, if a person wants to walk, um, the high path wants to be focused on just simply doing what's right because it's right. Um, cultivating a good character society does not really reward that you're the, you're the one who kind of like gets the short end of the stick a lot of the times, um, mm -hmm. you know, because there's always somebody out there who's going to exploit that and take advantage of you for that. And, you know, the question is, you know, are, are you willing to just continue doing what's right, no matter the consequences, because just simply because it's right. And you've got to be okay with yourself. You've got to be able to look yourself in the mirror and sleep well at night. And, um, you know, this is what having that orientation to that higher principle will do for you. It will make you want to be a virtuous person, no matter mm -hmm. what the external circumstances are. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, oh. in regards to the draft, we have the strange phenomenon of the, the left wing man who is uh, probably not physically fit for military service anyway. <laughs> That's true, um, <laughs> but they will they will be forced. I, I imagine that if we ever got, and I, I pray we don't, I mean, I'm too old. I don't think they would send me. Well, they might actually, because in the Ukraine, they- I don't know. I don't think the US is gonna win that one with the quality no. of men they have to draft. At the <laughs> well, I, I, I agree, unless, you know, that being thrown into the, into the fire is, uh, you know, the best way to like forge a stronger man. Like sometimes they just gotta face that reality, right? Yeah. A so, big part of why men are struggling so much is not because their lives are too hard. It's because their lives are actually too easy. And instead of actually facing physical challenges from a young age that build up their confidence and ability, they, um, they just get to adulthood and then they can't even cope with emotional challenges. Mm -hmm. Like they're, they're, they're internally and externally not resilient. And it is that for, for boys, it is really essential to be given physical challenges. And it is really what makes you into a man in some ways. Um, yeah. I used to work with kids a lot, almost exclusively boys, like, um, kind of older primary school boys getting to that age where they're really getting into sports and being very rough and tumble and stuff like that. And, Oh man, the worst thing in their lives was usually their helicoptering mother who wanted them wrapped in cotton wool. And then yeah. their father who was just like, well, we can't upset your mother. <laughs> and yep. I was like, you're hurting your son. You're hurting him so much. You don't even know. Yeah. Yeah. I had oh, to get absolutely. out of it. It was just painful to watch. Yeah, no, that, that'll kill a man too. That's why I think we have all this male suicide and all these, you know, these other issues. But okay, back to the super chat. So I got a super chow from Egregious Charles who gives us ten dollars and says, "Very interesting perspectives. Thanks, Philosophicat." And Charles. Yep. And then we got Johnny Boy Quick Draw who gives us two dollars and says, "Cool guest. Appreciate the chat. Keep on keeping on." All right. So that's everything I think. Let me just check here. Uh, make sure that I'm not missing anything. All right. Cool. So we're gonna wrap this up, but uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, do you think, you know, you said that you, you, you've you mentioned a few videos that you're gonna be working on or some other subjects that you, or topics you wanna expand on. Maybe after those have come out, um, you know, we could have you back on and talk more about sure. this stuff. I, I love, so one of the things I love to talk about is uh, art, cause I am an artist. And um, I, I've been I, I've studied art history and I've, I have a bare, very large interest in like the stories that art tells. Right. So not necessarily like a blanket appreciation of everything that 
you know, we have determined to be art, but rather something that speaks to something, you know, deeply human and universal. And so um, uh, this was why I, I had to talk touch on Lord of the Rings a little bit because, you know, they're, they're planning on making this new show on Amazon Prime that I think misses the point of everything Tolkien ever did. And personally, I believe that most of what we consider our mainstream popular culture exists not just to subvert, not just to try to take control over these narratives, but to destroy everything. I mean, it's just about that. It's just about raising it to the ground. It's cultural vandalism to me and nothing more because, uh, so it's not even really to satisfy like people's insecure narcissism about needing to see themselves in a piece of work. Uh, I, I think that they just want to make everyone as miserable and nihilistic and um, demoralized as they are. Yeah, and I made a video about that actually myself on um, on the Rings of Power. And yeah. Um, it was very popular when it came out, which kind of surprised me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think because everybody was talking about it at the time. Yeah. I think it was right around when they released the first trailer for that show. And I just, oh, it's so cringy. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but but yeah, because of that, though, I do like to talk about like when I see something, especially if it's older, because they tend to embody the same kind of, uh, you know, like you mentioned that Disney movie. There were probably things in it that you know for sure would never be done today by Disney. Like never in a million years, right? And I think it's because uh, obviously people weren't the same then, but I think there was like a different, a very different way that we viewed storytelling and story crafting. Uh, whereas before, I think that more people were still sort of like looking at archetypes and, you know, like the the stories of the ancient past, where whatever it is they were reaching toward, looking at the patterns that repeated, you know, all around the world and in many different cultures, but they were telling the same kinds of stories. Whereas today, you know, it's not just that people are not talented or, uh, or they're lazy or whatever, but it's that they just don't have that connection. They, they don't even understand, you know, what, what that is. I think they're completely lost. And so uh, that's one of the things I like to talk about. So maybe we can talk about movies or something next time. Sure. I don't right. watch a ton of movies myself, but I could probably say something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, or, you know, books too. I mean, either way. So, uh, all right. Well, anyway, thank you again, Philosophicat, for coming on the show. Thank you guys for watching. If you like this video, please hit like, subscribe if you're not already, subscribe to the channel. Uh, again, follow us on Rumble, and uh, I think we're on uh, D Live. I always forget that one. Uh, Rumble, D Live, and um, Facebook and Twitter, and. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you guys think about what we discussed. Uh, if you want to add anything, maybe you, you know, there's something that we mentioned that you wanted to expand on or you have some personal experience with something, please share that with us. And uh, most importantly, please share this video because sharing is caring. And I think that, you know, we, these conversations uh, need to continue to happen in whatever way is, you know, best for people. Uh, sometimes we talk about the political, but I also really enjoy discussing this on like a, you know, metaphysical or philosophical level as well. Because if we don't have the, the a complete understanding, how are we going to know where we're supposed to go? So um, thank you guys so much. I want to thank my guest again. You can find links to where she is in the description. And uh, with that said, have a good day, everybody. And we'll talk to you all in the next video. Thank you. Men's right activists are machines, dude. Okay. They are literal machines. They are talking point machines. They are impossible to fucking deal with. Especially if you have like, especially if you have like a, a couple dudes who have good memory on top of that too. Holy shit. You're fucked.